Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us from all over the world for our event, Voices of Resistance, Iranian Art Today. My name is Negar Siari. I'm a PhD candidate in linguistics and a teaching assistant in Persian Studies program at Georgetown University. If at any time you would like to pose a question, please use the Q&A box on Zoom uh, so that you may we may address that question uh, during the designated Q&A session. Uh, as always, questions are welcome in English, Persian, and Finglish. And now I have the pleasure of introducing the founder and director of the Persian Studies Program at Georgetown University, Professor Farima Mostofi. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Persian Studies Program of Georgetown University, I would like to welcome you to Voices of Resistance, Iranian Art Today, our 14th Jolly News Lecture Series in the form of a webinar. We really appreciate your presence today and your interest in our cultural events. We are planning to have two more events this semester that you will receive soon the information. Let me also extend my gratitude to Shahrzad and Farhad Jolinos that without their help, these cultural events would not have taken place. Now I'm pleased to welcome our panelists, Mrs. Sepide Mehraban, Dr. Sheida Soleimani, Mrs. Ginos Tafizadeh, and present you our moderator, Dr. Pamela Karimi. Pamela Karimi is an architect and an architectural historian and a professor of art history at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. She is the author of Alternative Iran, Contemporary Art and Critical Spatial Practice, published at Stanford University Press in 2002. I turn to you, dear Dr. Karimi, and thank you all for accepting our invitation. Hello, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to be the moderator for this panel that includes uh, three outstanding artists, Sheda Soleimani, Sepi Demehraban, and Jinus Tarizadeh. Uh, if you are curious uh, uh, to know more about these artists, uh, I believe in the chat box, there are links that are shared with you uh, regarding um, uh, the profile of these artists and further information. So please feel free to click on those links as you're um, listening to us. Um, I'm going to let uh, the artists to elaborate on their work and their backgrounds um, uh, um, during their own time slots for presentation in this panel. Uh, but at this point, um, I want to take this opportunity uh, to um, uh, talk with you a little bit about the content of this panel, the subject matter of this panel, and what's going on in terms of um, in terms of um, uh, you know art related to the recent movement and protest art and resistance art uh, before. Uh, the recent revolution, woman, life, freedom. So on that note, I'm going to share with you um, a little uh, PowerPoint presentation. So the world's first encounter with the tragic murder of Masa Amini by Iran's morality police was through her image as millions around the world browsed through social media, they were shocked by the image of the unconscious Amini hooked up to ventilators, her punishment for showing some her through a loosely worn scarf. The photograph was so influential that a week after its release, its brave photographer, journalist Nelofar Hamedi, was in prison. Despite government pressure, artists began reproducing this horrific image. In a stylized reiterations, the portrait of Amini was at times coupled with morning songs or counter-revolutionary music, as in the colorful animation by Nick Saad Khaluzadeh that went viral. In the days after Amini's murder, thousands of Iranians protested all over Iran. 
Remarkably, whether from an art background or not, the actions of these groups bordered on performance, such as women dancing and twirling head scarves or little girls posing on veils before, back, before blackboards. If not killed by beatings, bullets, and non-combat paintballs that can be fatal when shot at close range, once identified and captured, many protesters faced arrest, imprisonment, punishment, even execution. Portraits, uh, uh, portraits and art inspired by the victims quickly became the hallmark of the revolution with the slogan, Woman, Life, Freedom. Apart from its feminist edge and extra ordinary bravery of the youth, one thing that distinguishes this revolution from previous uprisings is the brashness and boldness of its art and its image. Whether in the visual arts, theater, or film, Iranian post-revolutionary protest and activist art, by contrast, has always been somewhat subdued because art inside Iran has long been monitored by an organization that operates like the infamous morality police, the Ministry of Culture and Islamic Guidance. Iranian artists of all branches have had to improvise to flout this organization's rules. For four decades, without saying too much about oppression, artists have used metaphor or espoused subversive appropriation, distanciation, parody, and pastiche to interrogate foundational ideologies of the regime. Operating in disguise is another tactic, um, even when the ministry's permission is granted. And I have elaborated many examples of such tactics in my book, which was published actually recently, not in 2002, but 2022, and it's called Alternative Iran, Contemporary Art and Critical Spatial Practice. These tactics used by all kinds of art experts include distancing oneself from the official centers of art production, deploying camouflage, negotiating the limits of the permitted by manipulating art menus, and utilizing ephemeral installations. Notably in this category are works by Genus Tarizadeh, who is with us today in this panel today. And Genus uh, comes to us uh, from Iran very, very recently. She's now based in Canada, but she moved out of Iran very recently. And we are so lucky to have her because her voice is uh, uh, the voice of Iranian artists who are working and operating in Iran right now. For many years, Genus has interjected and interrupted public spaces of the city and has produced phenomenal uh, political and activist art projects. Many of these projects don't bring any revenues for Tapizade, and um, that's all the more an indication of how important her work has been on the ground on the streets of Tehran and other cities. Using such as spatial strategies, um, artists have flouted the ministry's rules, showcasing politically sensitive art without getting into trouble. Certain styles have emerged as a result of these artistic practices, notably in theater, Teatra Apartamani, or apartment theater, and in cinema, as we're all uh, uh, aware, uh, allegory um, has been a very dominant theme. By comparison, art coming out of Iran since September, or I should say coming from Iran or by diasporic artists since September has a radical and rebellious zeal. Misama Azarzad's political images are uh, uh, one category among many. So are works by uh, graphic designer uh, Pedram Harbi. Who's formerly, for, who was formerly known for his cleverly subdued posters for political art events, such as this one, which is a performance inside a Tehran taxi by theater director Azadeh Ganje. It did not take too long for Iran's cyber police to pinpoint many of these artists, and therefore many of these arts have started to um, show up on social media under aliases. Also, a lot of artists in Iran have abandoned exhibitions and official works and performances in order to create anonymous works, such as this one or this one by um, students of art 
at Tehran University's Faculty of Arts um, uh, with uh, the one in the front in a pose that reminds us of Khoda Nur Leji that we all know. Um, it is not just the artists who are performing anonymously. Activism itself, since the start of the revolution in September, has become a form of art. You probably recall that in late November, a slew of images emerged on social media platforms showing layered uh, pads or women's tampons on CCTV cameras in train cars. At first glance, uh, the covered surveillance cameras looked like decorated flowers, then it became clear that this is an extreme act of bravery. So to sum up, the revolution seems to have revolved around powerful images of these brave acts circulating on social media. So powerful indeed that they can change your heartbeat and make you cry or even wretch. Since September, images of the Iranian revolution have shaped and formed us as subjects constituting the limits of how we can see and sense. It is for this reason that today we have gathered to discuss the role and significance of art and images in this revolution. On this note, I'm going to stop sharing my PowerPoint presentation and I'm going to turn the platform to Jinus Tarizadeh who in lieu of showing images of her previous art is going to read us a manifesto that she has crafted and the manifesto is regarding the art of the revolution now. So Jinus, it's all yours. Thank you. Bruce Khush, thank you, Pamela John. This is my honor to talk in this great program about an important issue that is occupying all of our minds these days. I was informed that I may talk about my artwork as an artist whose artistic career has always been linked to the political and social concerns. But I'm not going to do this now because I think uh, in this situation, activist action is more important than my name and my artwork. Anyone who is curious um, can find images of my arts utilizing, utilizing um, search engines. I prefer to use this opportunity for something bigger than my art. So um, the great contemporary poet of uh, Iran, Ahmad Shamlu, says in his poem, تمامی الفاظ جهان را در اختیار داشتیم و آن نگفتیم که به کار آید چرا که تنها یک سخن یک سخن در میانه نبود آزادی ما نگفتیم تو تصویرش کن We had at our back all the words of the world and yet did not say a worthy thing for all that we say one word was absent freedom we did not pronounce it but you paint it. Honestly, even though I am a huge fan of Sean Lu, I don't like this particular poem at, at all. His uh, tone and the kind of gesture um, for me evokes dilemma. It is about artists taking responsibility for lack of commitment by others. It is about are being disposable. It is about art being secondary to literature, politics, philosophy. It is about artists being controlled by others, what to do and what not to do. In general, whenever we have talked about the role of art and the reflection of the voice of resistance, we have faced this view. It is like in everyone's mind, uh, the artist area, uh, artists are a tool that must do what is asked for them and fulfill the responsibility that is placed on their shoulders. Uh, the limit of uh, this duty must be determined by others and the artist is the only one who performs it and presents it. Uh, the artist, we are re responsible for 
portraying the mentality of others and otherwise if artists we neglect this task or have our different vision they we deserve to be humiliated when we talk about art in the time of protest revolution and political and social movement what kind of arts are we talking about a kind of art illustrates the message of the movement or make that movement audible in musical form when we talk about art and resistance are we talking about posters murals graffitis and revolutionary songs i want to ask many questions for some of them i have precise answers and um, as an act uh, activist and also as an artist but i don't have any uh, answer for some of them. And I try to clarify the situation for myself by constantly asking questions and finding a different answer each time. In fact, these questions are way to are way to think about the subject and ponder which uh, these subjects have emerged. Resistance uh, and social action are concepts uh, that cannot be taught um, of without careful consideration in the constantly changing context. Those related to history, social ranks, and nowadays uh, social media status. The first question uh, is whether artwork related to resistance and movement uh, is necessarily produced by artists. Is the true uh, is it true that uh, those who are not defined under the title of artist are incapable of producing art? Isn't using any form of expression considered art? Must an art project or art product be produced for it to call art? If the artist produce an art object according to the classical medium of art, they know art that they know, uh, have they done something against the radical spirit of resistance? Uh, is the artist's uh, career path and uh, the artist's lifestyle related to the art they make during uh, time of political appeal? Uh, can we talk about this uh, context and background and forgot the economies of art production? Can art be produced without financial support? Indeed, what kind of art can be produced without access to financial resources? And if it needs uh, financial resources for it to be materialized, how important is it that those res uh, resources have a relation to the meaning of the political action movement or resistance during a time like this how about the artists themselves in order to survive and benefit from the level of their intellectual ideas knowledges creativity and technical ability to put, produce uh, artwork for resistance doesn't the artist need to have access to basic necessities for their survival like other professions and jobs why is everything about are more difficult and more controversial? Is it because people can't consider being an artist a job? Uh, is artist uh, is a job or hobby or social duty? Um, is the art that we need in a situation like women life freedom uprising a kind of functional and disposal form? Should resistance art aesthetically pleasing? Um, is aesthetics important in resistance art? Is uh, it possible to judge this kind of artworks with usual and familiar aesthetics criteria? Should the artwork in the, um, that is produced with the specific function for uh, resistance in all mediums of visual arts, music, cinema, etc., be judged at all? Is the art at all 
or it is just some sort of attraction for social media? Do protest artwork have place in the art platform, such as museum, galleries, theater, or concert halls? Does resistance art belong to the street? Should it appear or on the social media? If protest art uh, present in all of platform, uh, platforms means that the artists want to make credit for themselves with that, should this artwork be uh, presented without the names of the artists, their artists? If uh, artists put their names on the artwork, are they taking credit from that political protest? Or conversely, uh, are they spending their social credits for the movement? Where does the artist's social uh, credibility come from? From people, from the media, from their own personal effort and resistance? Do artists have a duty to use their artistic license uh, to produce artwork, or should they continue their protest acti activity like an other activist on the street? Are all educated in the humanities or different branches of academia and other intellectuals expected to dedicate part of their works or their entire life to the resistance? Are artists considered intellectual or celebrities? Should a celebrity artist use their media attraction and platform to spread the voices of uh, protesting people? When and if they do, is it to be considered self-promotion or not? Are there any differences, uh, differences between artists form inside the country and those in diaspora in the way they deal with resistance? Is one preferable to the, uh, the other? Where is the boundary of show off and amplifying resistance voices to the world? Who determines this boundary? Who has the right to decide? In the midst of an uprising, can an art produce real artwork or should just help the production of propaganda works? Shouldn't the art wait for, the, for it to mature? Should we expect the artist to do their artistic work quickly and in sync with the political movement and also produce mature artworks in meaning and aesthetics and at the same time not to be afraid of consequences and not worry about their livelihood and survive is it artist a robot i have many questions uh, in mind and i'm sure you do as well sometimes maybe posing a question is more effective and challenging than finding an answer. And uh, is it, isn't the work of the art, after all, to pose question in the people's mind? Thank you, Janice. Um, Sapira, I believe this is your turn. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Pamela and Genius, for your wonderful talks, thought-provoking uh, question by Genius. Um, to just give you a short introduction of who I am and what I do, I was born in 1986 in Tehran, Iran. I moved to South Africa in 2012. I did my under, uh, undergrad studies in fine art at Al Zahra University, and then I completed my master's studies uh, focused on Persian art. Um, and then further, I continued my studies uh, at UCT in Cape Town, uh, focusing on my uh, personal experience of growing up in Iran in my master's studies and looking and comparing personal histories with public histories um, in my thesis. And recently I completed my uh, PhD and awarded a doctorate in philosophy comparing 
post-revolution in Iran with post-apartheid South Africa uh, and looking at how art could be a way to narrate personal histories of people who are part of a uh, political turmoil. Um, so I'm going to have a very short um, introduction of my work and what I have been doing for the last uh, 10 years uh, in my practice. Um, I would like to start first with this painting uh, titled Retracing. This painting, I made this uh, work in 2015 for my first solo exhibition in uh, Tehran at, Galler, uh, at Go uh, Golestan Gallery. Um, the inspiration behind the work was from uh, images of Iranian women who've been part of the revolution in 1979 and also the uprisings in uh, 1980 uh, against compulsory hijab. In my research, as well as my uh, art practice, I'm interested in uh, archives of uh, contemporary history of Iran and how uh, both bodies of women, uh, voice of women, have been obliterated from media, from textbooks, and what we taught in schools, there weren't ever voice of women uh, while they were um, at the front, front line. And also the whole discriminatory laws that been imposed to women uh, post-revolution. Um, this is image of me. I born, as I said, in 1986 in Tehran and since uh, age seven, um, like uh, many Iranian women being forced to cover up my body. This is image of me with my sister. Um, and then the right side, right bottom is me um, at uh, 15 years old, forced to cover up uh, my body, the, the most basic human right that um, we, we couldn't have, the freedom of choice. Then further in 2012, when I moved to Cape Town, I started to revisiting all these experiences and exploring that uh, through my research and through body of work and using my family photographs and also archives from the history in my paintings. Um, then moving a little bit more forward, uh, this is a screenshot uh, from a video that became viral uh, in 2009, uh, the scene that Nadal Sultan been shot to death during uh, peaceful uprisings that many of us been there, we, 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 it could have been any of us. And in fact, if Neda was with us today, three days ago was her 40th birthday. Um, this image stayed with me for long. And then in 2017, I decided that I want to make work to dedicate it to Neda. Um, I basically uh, wrote her name over and over that it's become uh, unreadable. And the title of the work is uh, She Was Dead. As I mentioned earlier, uh, I'm interested in uh, public history, notion of propaganda, censorship that's happened over the last 43 years uh, through uh, Islamic Republic of Iran. Uh, this is the image of uh, Khomeini arriving from exile from Paris. And over the years, because these people have been either forced to exile or executed as they were opposing government, uh, they were also physically being obliterated from images and from the media and um, the act of censorship and tampering of information constantly been happening. It is in this way that in my paintings, I'm kind of replicating the act of control censorship and how information being controlled. Further in 2018, I became interested in using cultural elements like Persian carpet in my paintings. As I introduced myself to everyone as Iranian, the first res response was Persian carpet, and I was like, there is something there. And the idea that these objects as artifacts carry so many stories, the art behind them, and the labor that goes to create these beautiful artifacts, they live in people's home, and in a way, they uh, symbolize uh, the personal histories of people. They travel all the way from Iran to South Africa. And then I use uh, images of the newsprints from 1979 as a parallel between public histories and personal histories. 
um, sorry, this is just something that's French wrong in my PowerPoint. Oh, sorry. Um, so, uh, I don't know, one of my images quite swapped. Uh, apologies for that. Um, and then um, recently I've been, oh, sorry. Okay, this was the slide that I was planning to show. Oh, I don't know why it's doing this. Um, apologies. Um, okay, just ignore the images. I'm going to just um, talk through and see what's, what's the problem. Um, recently in uh, 2013, I've been invited to uh, create an artwork as a part of Women Life Freedom uh, um, movement that is happening at the moment in Iran as a campaign to uh, create an artwork in front of United Nations in New York um, as a, a response to um, uh, to uh, invite a United Nations members to withdraw Iran from a state of uh, women's rights, uh, which has been um, successful and uh, it uh, resulted in um, withdrawing Iran from the seat. Um, okay, now it's the, my images start working. Apologies for that. So, this is the image of the installation. The installation was at uh, uh, for Freedoms Park at uh, New York City. And a group of artists collaborated. Shada, uh, the next artist, also was one of the collaborators. Um, and to end with, um, what is happening in Iran is inspiring, it's breaking our hearts, the brutality that government is doing to our people. But um, our wish is uh, for freedom, the uh, bravery of Iranian women. And um, I think this images that finding their way in social media is the way uh, for me to get inspired and using them in my art to amplify the fight for freedom. And my wish for Iran is freedom, women, life, freedom. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sepide. You can uh, stop sharing your PowerPoint at this point. Thank you. And uh, Shada, please take it away. Salam. Let me share my screen. Where is slideshow? Wait, if I'm start, how many be now? Okay, I'm gonna go with a yes on that. Salam, um, hi, my name is Shada Soleimani. Um, I am an artist and a professor. I'm based in Providence, Rhode Island, um, and I teach at Brandeis University. So a little bit of background I think is important and merci Genus and Sepide for your presentations. And, you know, Genus, you brought up so many things that I think about all the time, especially, and I think it's important to mention that I am an artist that was not born in Iran, um, but I was born to parents that are political refugees. Um, my father was a Marxist and pro-democracy activist who had to go into hiding, escaped over the mountains on horseback, made it to Turkey, and then was able to seek political refuge and came to the United States. My mother, when she was trying to escape, was caught at the border and because of her relationship to my father she was imprisoned and consequently tortured in prison for over a year and so I was raised I was born here I didn't learn how to speak English until a little later in life so I speak Farsi but it was really important for my parents to tell me about their lives to make sure that I understood you know what had happened to them and where they came from and even though I have not lived in Iran or have had the threat of the Iranian dictatorship over my life um, I'm very aware of because of them what their lives were like living under that
that regime. And so because of that, my father has always instilled to me that no matter what my job, but especially as someone that is a cultural maker or producer, it's important to not make artwork that's just of beautiful images or things. Um, it's our job as cultural producers to address the societal issues of our time. And I think, you know, in that I've always decided to focus on human rights violations in Iran, um, specifically, you know, issues that have been happening in the past decade or so um, and moving up into our current revolution right now. So inspired by, because I was born and raised here in the United States, I was very aware of the differences between being American and being an Iranian. Um, I was raised in Ohio, so there were no other Middle Eastern or, you know, other families from the Swana region. Um, everyone was very much, you know, not aware of the differences, for example, between Iran and Iraq after September 11th, or the complexities that come with, you know, having parents that are political refugees. And so in that, I really learned pretty quickly that there is a huge lack of understanding in the Eurocentric education systems that are teaching kids and people in the United States about the world. And this also became very important and apparent to me um, in January 3rd, 2020, when I was sitting at a bar in Texas, drinking my favorite drink, which is a Negroni, and my last name showed up on the TV screen. And I was like, oh God, this can't be good. And it said, Qasem Soleimani assassinated. And, you know, of course, knowing after living through September 11th here that Americans don't understand the complexities of the Swana region or Iran, that I was going to get a lot of backlash because of what was happening. And so I decided, you know, this is a great starting point to continue, you know, the commentary that I'm making about the political ha events happening in Iran, but to also talk about this event happening here. And so a lot of people were saying, oh we're, my God, Trump is so awful. You know, we're so sorry that he killed your uncle. People thought we were related. Other people were like, oh my God, thank God that Qasem Soleimani is dead. And so I thought a lot about this idea of blame shifting, you know, thinking about how some people view politicians as good and some people view them as bad. Which one's worse? Which one's better? And so I started by creating this diptych 1-8-2020 and PS-752, which was the name of the Ukrainian air jet that was shot down by an Iranian missile. Creating this diptych, one hand of Rouhani, one of Trump, but I don't say who is who, because the idea here is to think about these politicians, their gestures and how they tried to blame shift upon one another. Who's bad, who's worse? Thinking about symbols like the war hawk or the peace dove, associating you know, who might be better or worse in these circumstances. In the series, Lovers of Power, I'm isolating the gestures of politicians to you know, think about how we read politicians on the screen. How do we believe them? How do we come to understand if they're good or bad? And is that through how they're portraying themselves or the words they say? In the backgrounds of each of these images, which are constructed tableaus built tabletop, I'm printing source images of artifacts or actual evidence from events that have happened. So this in the background is an inverse infrared image of the missile hitting PS752, the jet, and in the background here are the ruins falling from the sky. In March of 2020, not a good time for the world. Um, obviously COVID, you know, had kind of come on the scene and we were all worried about what was happening, but the Iranian health minister came on TV and gave the speech and said, there's no such thing as COVID in our country, we're totally fine. But the whole time he was giving the speech, he was wiping his brow, sweating, and this you know, picture became extremely famous. Well, a few days later, it was confirmed that he had tested positive for COVID and he was giving that speech while positive for COVID. At the same time, we were also seeing these images come out of Iran, images of these aerial green grabs of Behisht de Zahra Cemetery, where there were mounds and mounds of lime powder to disintegrate the bodies of the pandemic dead. And of course, there'd be no need for lime powder if there were not mass casualties of the pandemic. Of course, the Iranian government was still saying at the time, COVID's not a problem and underplaying the numbers. So as I continued, you know, playing with the idea of these levers of power, literally the arms of these politicians, I thought about contextualizing them in these scenes and situations in which they are reacting to. So you have, you know, the health minister's arm amidst these fields of pandemic dead, toilet paper, 
again, a symbol of the pandemic, lime powder. Um, and not only am I focusing on politicians in this specific series, I'm focusing on activists or individuals that have been harmed by the Iranian government. So thinking about Ahmad News and thinking about the activist that was executed, lured back into the country, and Ruhol Lazam was lured back into the country and killed and executed by the Iranian government for what was referred to as under Sharia law, conspiracy on earth, um, colluding against the Iranian government. And one thing that they mentioned, you know, they mentioned the government said, because of this colluding, you know, committing crimes against the Iranian government, one of their pieces of evidence was that he was teaching people on his news platform, Ahmad News, how to make Molotov cocktails. So we have the hand of Khamenei and the hand of Ruhol Lazam connected by this Molotov cocktail. And the image is actually behind you see of him right after he had been taken into custody, lured back into the country. Another one that I thought was interesting was a New York Post article. And I mean, of course, we know New York Post is kind of a tabloid, you know, and you don't really trust it, but there was a front page cover story shortly after Qasem Soleimani's death that was, is Qasem Soleimani really dead? And they had on the cover a picture of his hand after that had been, you know, a casualty of the missile strike laying on the grass with a ring on it. And then they had his hand in life with the ring on it as well. And they were trying to say that the two rings that he was wearing, one in the severed hand and one in life were different and maybe he's not really dead. But I also started thinking about, you know, this idea of this kind of false news and this conspiracy and how do I kind of conflate the two? So in the image reflection of the mirror, you see his hand in death and his hand in life holding that image. And there's a bunch of images in this series, but I wanted to kind of fast forward to, you know, the women life freedom movement revolution really that is happening in Iran right now. And so when Masa Zina Amini was murdered by the you know, morality police in September of 2022, I thought it was extremely important to quickly, just like a bunch of other Iranians, react to what was happening and, you know, create a piece about her. So this is an image of Masa when she was alive. You see her hand in life. And so I wanted to use her hand as part of the levers. And then the same tradition in which I'm using these images of evidence in the background, I wanted to use this image. Um, a brain scan or a CT scan was leaked of her brain after she had been brutally beaten. And the coroner, the state coroner came, you know, online, he came on the news on TV and said, oh no, she didn't die because of a brain bleed. She died of natural causes. And this was, you know, I'm not a doctor, but I think it's very obvious that we could look at this section of the scan and see that this doesn't seem normal. There seems to be a crack in the skull. And so this also, image was also a huge part of people's reaction to being like, look, this is why she died. We know why she was taken, why she was beaten. And so I wanted to create this image of her hand in life holding a burning hijab, a reference to White Wednesdays, a movement in which women take off their hijabs and set them on fire with images of her brain scans in the background. And just like Sepida, I was part of the Women Life Freedom um, exhibition at Four Freedoms Park across from the United Nations in an effort to remove the, you know, Iran from the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women. And fortunately that happened. I think the next move is that we try to get, you know, Iranian government listed as a terrorist organization and hopefully removed from the commission as a whole. Um, so yeah, that's it for my work. Thank you so much, everyone. Zan Zendigi Ozodi. Thank you, Shada. Thank you, Sepide, and thank you, Jinas, for these beautiful presentations. Um, may I ask you to put your cameras on? Uh, so now we can have a little bit of discussion among the four of us before I turn the platform to our audiences for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so this was a beautiful presentation by the three of you. Um, I think in unison, uh, your works presented uh, three different versions of art production, political art production, 
among Iranian artists in both inside Iran as well as diaspora. Uh, with Jinus, we see the urge to intervene, interject, and question the meaning of art and the relevance of art for Iranian society. As I mentioned in my presentation, Jinus has long been acting on the ground in Iranian galleries, on Iranian streets, in order to make a change in the lives of Iranians um, inside Iran and on the ground. So she is actually dealing with art in a very real sense, for lack of a better word. Sepide comes from a generation that is a little bit younger than Genus, but in some ways the generation that was born during the 1980s or, 19, or 1360s Iranian calendar has suffered the most. Why? Because this is a generation that didn't see anything of the Shah's regime and of the freedoms that were available before the Islamic Revolution. And this is a generation that has been subject to oppression and limitations of all kinds by the Islamic Republic. This generation made an effort, a tremendous effort during the Green Movement to make a change in the system without getting rid of the regime. So basically, uh, in all their humbleness, they just wanted to make the society better in a very peaceful way. And they participated in the Green Movement, as we saw uh, the remnants of that in Sepide's work. Most of the people, the young people within this generation, participated in that movement. They created art, they went to the streets, they became victimized, uh, notably Neda Agha Sultan, who unfortunately lost her life during the course of demonstrations. Um, but a lot of people, a lot of artists from this generation, because of the backlash that they received from the government, uh, they became extremely disappointed by the regime and by the situation in Iran. So many of them moved out of Iran. Uh, I can name uh, a few of them that I know, for example, Gelare Khoshkozaran uh, or uh, Morakshin al Lahiri. Sepide belongs to that generation of artists who became disappointed with any changes within the system and uh, therefore moved out of Iran or uh, turned to um, other uh, forms of uh, presentation of their work and their thoughts inside Iran. Um, and then we have the work of Sheda Soleimani as a person who was also a victim of a system that came to power in 1979, but in a very indirect way, because Sheda was born here to political activist parents. And many of us have had those political activist relatives in our own families, and we know the pain that they went through. Uh, they had to get out of the country during very, very difficult circumstances, especially after the Iran-Iraq war started. It was extremely difficult for anyone to get out of Iran, uh, let alone political activists with leftist views. Um, um, and so Sheda is the product of the generation that tried to make a change for the better in the Iranian society, but failed spectacularly. And Sheda comes to a society that is not very uh, uh, receptive of uh, the kind of people that come out of the Middle East. And therefore, Sheda's imagination has been mediated by all the obstacles and difficulties that exist in the American society, especially when it comes to their perception of uh, the people of the Middle East. So in some ways, I think that all three of you are struggling and they're trying to show your struggle and all your difficulties in life through your political art. Uh, Genus does that through interventionist acts on the ground in the streets of Tehran and through manifestos that she uh, has just produced uh, for uh, the Woman Life uh, Freedom Movement. Mm, and she always asks questions because as she aptly showed us, 
uh, one of the important aspects of art making is to pose more questions rather than answer the questions. Politicians are supposed to provide answers to our questions, but artists are supposed to demand things and therefore they ask questions of us, of our politicians and of all kinds of audiences. Sepide uh, uh, is representative of that generation who suffered uh, through this revolution and a lot of her work has a mourning characteristic, if I will, mourning for the loss of life during the Green Movement and so on and so forth. And Sheda uh, um, is definitely uh, a, a diasporic artist who has spent all of her life here in the United States and she's trying to fight two different, on two different fronts, if you will. Um, first and foremost, the Iranian front, but also the American front. And therefore, a lot of her art, appropriately so, are mediated by images of Iran rather than the real circumstances of life in Iran. So on this note, I want to turn the platform to you to ask you this question. Um, you know, what do you think of your role as an activist artist and as a political artist, whether in Iranian society or um, uh, or in Iran, uh, what do you think artists um, uh, can uh, do to make changes within the system? As I mentioned in my introductory um, presentation, I feel like with uh, the presence of social media and the prominence of images in our lives, uh, images have become uh, more important uh, than words, than literature, than newspaper articles, uh, so we are in a very, very different moment in the history of revolutions in the world, I should say. Um, um, so what do you think of your role as an artist within this context where revolution obviously matters, but images of the revolutions matter too? Um, please take it away. Um. For explaining this, I want to um, return to the poem that I read earlier, um, Shamlu's poem, For Iran Gravity, a poem by a male poet to a female painter. In, the poem, in that poem, Shamlu mentions some common images of Iranian painting, like images of gardens, deers, and requests from the artist that paint what he as a poet hasn't written about human suffering and injustice with all the countless words that he knew. He said, paint it. <laughs> uh, the determinative gaze, the omniscient view from above and dictates to the artist what to do. Um, I think, um, um, something maybe during this uprising, in the spirit of this uprising, and woman life freedom must be changed for in every, every uh, part of our daily life and our practice about art, more than, um, more than artwork that, that we make, something must be changed in our view about ourselves as a um, woman artist or as an artist uh, completely. Um, I'm thinking about this part. Um, I feel um, I feel tired of constantly providing myself as a female artist. If the slogan of the woman life freedom does not bring this, uh, then how should it flow, um, flow in our daily life and practice? As a female artist in general and beyond of uprising against the in injustice and the systematic discrimination of a totalitarian system, we must also be free from patri uh, patriarchal view, I think. We must let go uh, of the end of this area and determine when 
where and how we are and uh, we are or not artists <laughs> actually the spirit of the revolution is female spirit full of life creation every moment is of new exp experience this movement is trying to take back all of the things that they gave from us to take back the activity to take back the um heightness and take back the bo body um, something that's really um amazing i think during this time is that we take back an important medium that completely neglected during 44 years dance we take back body and uh in this revolution they have seen all the captured and killed youth dancing in private spaces or in happy dances in city squares i think dance has been one of the most important achievement uh, that we take back this totally forgotten um, and banned medium um the liberation of subjected bodies led to the reclaiming of the dance uh, of dance and um, its recovery and artistic medium. Uh, I think it is very important. I, I try to think about concepts more than a specific piece of art that maybe later remind me us about this period. I I just think about something that achieved. Absolutely, Genus. Um, I appreciate that view. In other words, you're saying that art at this juncture is not just representation of what's happening in the outside world, but that art itself is changing something within the structures that are known to us. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. Shada, do you want to continue on this discussion? Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because I think about this a lot as I teach and I have to teach with images. And so thinking about the generation of students that I'm teaching and what type of images are they looking at and what type of images do they have access to, or even thinking about growing up and, you know, my understanding of Iran from my parents versus the very different understanding of Iran that I was learning about in school or through a Western lens and through the images that I'd see on TV. And so something that Saifida said that I thought was also very interesting that was similar to my experience was that a lot of kids, you know, that when I was growing up was, were also asking about Persian rugs. And, you know, do you have rugs? Do you have oil? Do you have all of these things that, you know, are put into the psyches or like the image streams in the minds of Americans or Westerners or non-Iranians to understand what a country is without really understanding the history of a country. And so then I think the job of an artist or artists in this movement or you know, throughout history of revolution is to create an awareness of a history that is not exoticizing, that's not fetishizing, that's not supporting these notions that you know, are constantly put upon us. Um, when I talk to my students, I think about how, you know, social media and Instagram, for example, is a very curated sphere. We can decide who we follow or who we don't follow, what we like or what we don't like. And so there's this idea of these images of trauma being too traumatic, being too destructive. We can't look at them because they make us sad. And so if you can't, or if you have a difficult time looking at these images of trauma, which of course I understand, and, you know, I think they should either be shared sensitively or not shared, then how can we spread information about these things that are happening without sharing destructive or traumatic images? And I think that's the job of artists as storytellers is we have the ability to communicate these traumas in ways that perhaps they're more palatable, like a Trojan horse. They still have the ability to, you know, get through and get the message across, but maybe they don't have to do it in a traumatic way. Something I hear a lot though also from Iranians is, you know, especially Iranians that have come here to the States, they've had a difficult time being here or assimilating. And so they're wanting so hard and so badly to be part of American society that they're like, well, why can't you describe the positive aspects of Iran, that it's beautiful and that we have roses and pomegranates. And of course, while all of those things exist and are so important to the culture, it's foolish to turn a blind eye to the atrocities that are happening back home as well. Excellent. Thank you very much, um, Shada. Uh, Sepida. Um, 
I think I, I, I would just say what I experienced and how like the, the power that art and artists have. Um, they, there's not a big Iranian community in Cape Town. We are a very small community. And when, well, when all this uprising started, we felt desperate. We were like following the news on social media, what we can do and what we can, as an artist, how we can use our platform. And then um, me with two other Iranian artists, Navada Rakhshani and Kham Yarabinish Tariq, we talked that as uh, Shada said, we want to do something, but we don't want to be violent. We don't want to be angry, but we want to bring awareness of what is happening in our homeland uh, to community in South Africa. So we came with this idea inspired by the movement was happening with uh, Iranian artists in Iran uh, who making birds. Uh, that is from this uh, Eastern proverb that if you make thousand birds, your wish would come true. And our wish was freedom for Iran. And we opened it up to the public. We wouldn't, we didn't know how many people would rock up. Uh, we just opened it up. And in course of a day, we managed to make more than thousand uh, paper birds, uh, people showing up the support. And just that simple moment of like humanity and how art could bring people together to have conversations, to raise questions to what's the next step. I think that's the power of art. And I never saw myself as an activist, which is so strange, but because recently I've been posting a lot on social media, media because I felt like I'm powerless. I can't do anything. I'm not, I'm not in Iran to go to streets and protest. That was my way of like sharing uh, news with, with communities that won't know about it. Then people will comment and say that your activism, your art activism is uh, powerful. And then my penny dropped. I realized like the platform that I have is very powerful and people are watching and people are responding and people bringing lots of uh, different voices together. And I think that's the beauty of art. Uh, that's the language that everybody could respond to. Thank you. Um, uh... Um, I must say that we have until 3.30 uh, to discuss the different uh, important topics uh, related to this panel. I wanted to tell you that we have four questions in the Q&A so far, but I want to encourage our audiences to place more questions in the Q&A section, and I will address them after this follow-up question for Sheda and Sepide. Uh, so, um, Sheda, when you talk about the perception of or the reception of Iran or Iranian art, you're very specific about the American context um, and how America, because of its relationship with Iran during the revolution of 1979, the hostage taking uh, processes and so on and so forth, America has issues with the Islamic Republic of Iran and therefore the animosities are on a wholly different uh, uh, scale compared to European countries or even South Africa. But what we have seen during uh, this uh, recent revolution, Woman Life Freedom, is that uh, people from around the world um, uh, have have unified to defend Iran, the Iranian people. Um, so it doesn't matter whether we are in Australia, in New Zealand, or South Africa, or America, or Europe. Uh, um, all the people have joined together in order to defend the Iranian people, especially Iranian women who have lived under uh, oppression for 43 years now. Um, I wanted to ask you, Sepide, so the, the political um, situation in America is all clear to us, and Sheda uh, has reflected upon that both verbally as well as through her art so beautifully and clearly. What is the view and perception of Iran in South Africa? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Is it positive? Is it negative? Is it completely absent in the artistic discourse of South Africa? Sure. Um, it's... To, to just give you background in relation between Iran and South Africa is very strange. Iranian government and South African government always had good relations. 
during apartheid, the monarchy uh, used to visit uh, South Africa. They used to, they, in fact, the older generation remember the king and queen visiting Iran. So that's the uh, visiting South Africa. And that's one of the first responses that people say that they remember uh, pre-revolution. And then there's this uh, image of what happened during a uh, revolution and the country suddenly has changed and things are macabre and uh, there's a Islamic totalitarian regime that's um, going um, to oppress people. But on the other hand side, the South, South African government, the current government is in very good relation still with the Iranian government. Mm -hmm. And it hasn't been, and is, is the same situation, uh, South African government even haven't opposed to Russian government. And that comes from the transition from the apartheid time uh, because um, the leftish group supported uh, the freedom fighters in South Africa. And that ties now to the relation and support of Russia. The same story happens with what happened with change of regime in Iran. So what government supporting is very different of what people supporting in a way. Um, and depending on which uh, communities you approach, there are um, different responses, um, like uh, in university, in um, same when I uh, talk with my students about the movement and what is happening, people are interested, they are very open, they've been very supportive, but at the same time, there are very conservative groups that they support regime of Iran and they find that Legit, legit, legitimate that of what is happening in Iran. Um, it's uh, to save Islam and it's that's misunderstanding. And that's why more than anything, we're trying to kind of create this conversation that this uprising is not against religion. This is not against Islam in general. This is not Islamophobic act. This is uh, asking for freedom of choice, uh, for liberty. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answered your question. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Sepire, for shedding light on the situation on the ground in South Africa. South Africa is very important when it comes to political art, as you know, uh, and, and therefore, you know, we during our careers, we have looked up to South African artists such as William Cambridge, but it's very, very interesting and important uh, to know through you that the situation is not as simple as that, that there are a lot of complexities. And thank you to you and to your colleagues um, from the Iranian background in South Africa who are fighting on the ground to, uh, uh, to make clear what Iran's situation is about. I, I really appreciate that. So because we don't have a lot of time left, if you don't mind, I'm going to turn to the questions in the Q&A box. But uh, with apologies to some of our um, um, audiences who have actually admired your presentations, uh, I'm going to read these questions, uh, not in the order that they appeared, uh, but based on what I think is most relevant to our discussion today. Um, so one question comes from Leili, who asks a very important question. She says, what is the strength of camaraderie between Iranian artists of diaspora and those in Iran? Also, how supportive have Western artists been to these three women in their activism and how, and she's obviously referring to you, um, what more could be done by all of us to support the Iranian artists in and out of the country. Take it away, any of you who's ready to answer, please. I mean, I think, um, oh yeah, I'm on. Um, I think one thing that I have realized that there is, you know, a very like high level of camaraderie between Iranian artists of the diaspora and those within Iran. And I think that's something for the diaspora, but also we recognize our privilege in being in a place where we have the ability to speak freely and safely about, you know, what is happening in Iran versus artists in Iran having to live in fear of their lives. And so through working together and having that 
relationship, we can, you know, build and create awareness in these ways. Um, I think one thing, I mean, the supportiveness of Western artists to women and their activism, I think something Dr. Kennedy said that was interesting, you know, yes, people in the West have been supportive and there has been a large show of support and we have been joined by, you know, people that are not Iranian in protests and in elevating and raising the voices. But there still is a large percentage of people that don't understand the revolution and don't understand the movement. Similar to what Sefita said, a lot of people are worried that if they support women life freedom, they're being Islamophobic. They don't understand, you know, that this isn't about religion. This is about freedom of choice. And so I think if there's one thing that, you know, someone could do to continue supporting Iranian voices is to continue elevating the voices, continue sharing, continue. I think there's a really great um, Instagram account, for example, called From Iran that gives updates about what's happening inside of Iran. And it's just like a great way to get tidbits of like history, information. And, you know, people inside the country are asking, please just share and elevate our voices. And I think at this point, that's the most we could be doing or the best thing we could be doing while continuing to push for things like you getting the United Nations to remove Iran from the charter, if at all possible. Shada, what is that Instagram account that you just referred to? I could put it in the chat. Hopefully it goes to Thank you. It's called, yeah, it's called from, and I think it has like an underscore Iran. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I, am, I am with you on that note Shada that there's been uh, some misunderstandings about about what's going on on the ground in Iran these days especially when it comes to um, anti-Islam uh, moves or things that appear to be anti-Islamic um, faith um, uh, you know and, and and that is a very complicated issue right so not not just coming from like you know more uh, uh, more more conservative religious people or less informed people, but also as Bahare uh, Hedayat, uh, journalists and feminists from inside prisons in um, from inside the Evin prison, has written recently. Uh, there seems to be a misunderstanding, or or uh, for lack of a better word, among uh, Western intellectuals uh, who have long used post-colonial theory. And within the context of these frameworks, these meta narratives of post-colonial theory, there's so much respect for, uh, you know, traditions and conventions, and that we shouldn't attack these traditions and conventions of the non-West. Uh, so it is, it has become a dilemma, if you will, uh, for um, Western academia to explain what exactly is going on in Iran today, and and you know it, it's our our job to think about these complicated problems right to find answers to them um i am going to read a question that is um directly related to um the work of genus so genus i know you wanted to say something but but i'm going to also take advantage of the opportunity to read this question and if you want to tie your thought right now to this question feel free to do so so Golna says to Genis, how do you feel the visual art has changed in the last uh, decade? Mm. Um, at first, I wanted to say something about the last question. And I'm not academician, and uh, maybe I'm more free to <laughs> say something more than you. And, always when people have right to talk about Islamophobia, and I have my right about my Islamotrauma. Okay. <laughs> it, this is two terms parallel. So um, I have, I, um, I consider this right for myself. <laughs> As, um, about this uh, question, uh, it's really difficult to say because um, visual art never had so many audience and maybe elite of a society is uh, involved with um, visual uh, art and uh, working with usual uh, visual art in long scale is related to public spaces and related to 
government financial support. And I can say lots of Iranian artists avoid to be this position. So um, maybe our um, effect on um, society is not that much that we want, but uh, maybe because of a part of, um, uh, because so many things, it's more controversial than another mediums, more than cinema or music or theater. Uh, so in Iran, uh, now we, ha we have a big strike from galleries and artists. Um, and we know that is very difficult and people are, uh, they have lots of uh, problem for the survive and everything. And maybe um, they uh, have to handle more um, expectation from another part of, uh, another mediums, maybe for people is normal about something that is related to a big production like cinema. But this big will has to work, <laughs> to work, but not about visual art. Uh, but I think we always try to change something small and, this, and more and more and more and sometimes we put this uh, big stone on mountain and again and again and again um, and i know maybe uh, our work was a little bit more difficult than another mediums because we don't have uh, so many possibilities to change but just we try I don't know if that was the answer for that question or not. Well, thank you so much, Janus. As somebody who's very interested in art um, that has transformed the society since the beginning of the Islamic Re Revolution against all odds, I know exactly what you mean, that artists have never given up on their activism. Uh, whether through subtle gestures or underground performances, uh, they have continued um, uh, the path of resistance um, and they have not given up. And it's because of the work that artists have done since the beginning of the revolution. Now, many of them are in their late seventies, right? But they're still educating, if they're still alive and with us, they're still educating the younger generation of artists. And we are very, very grateful for these conversations and debates that are taking place inside Iran, but also, uh, especially with COVID on social media platform, I think that one of the one of the good things there were so many bad things about COVID, but one of the tiny good things that came out of COVID is that it tied us together. The Iranian community inside Iran and diaspora joined voices on different social media platforms um, in order to exchange ideas. Um, and I really, really appreciate that kind of conversation. That the walls and barriers have been removed among us and now we are more in more direct conversation with one another now um there is a very touching question in the chat box by a grandmother who's talking about her grandchildren being interested in art and i know it's it's it might sound like a simple question because she's asking you what should i tell my grandchildren if they are interested in pursuing an artistic career it's but i'm going to turn that, that question does, on yeah. its head she does ask you, uh, so, so many of you are also educators right what do you see um what do you see um when you think about the future of art uh, what can art do for us in the future, for the future of Iran, but also the future of our world in general? Anyone, uh, take it away. Yeah, I mean, I think art is just so important in so many ways. I mean, we're always thinking about maths and sciences, and then as Iranians, we're always thinking about success and like being, you know, part of the diaspora and how do we make it? And obviously those things are attached to ideas like, you know, making money and as much as art might not it might be a precarious existence um 
I believe that it's completely necessary. I mean, it creates creative problem solvers, people that tackle things differently. Instead of hitting it with policy, you can hit it with, you know, something that's undermining or kind of taking things apart from underground. Um, I don't think that people are born with talents. I think that talent is honed. Um, it's built through community. It's built through learning. It's built through discussion and it's built through nurturing. You know, like I definitely wasn't like born with a paintbrush in my hand. I hate when artists say that like, oh, I was born an artist. You know, you might have had a natural inclination towards it and that might have grown because maybe it was encouraged. Um, as much as education systems, being someone that does teach at a university, they, you know, education, I believe, should be free. It's not, unfortunately. Um, so it is precarious to think about sending someone to school for something like art. But I do believe that you know, being in a community. I think the reason that I've been able to get to where I am as an artist is because I did go to school for it. And because of going to school for it, I met other people. And along the way, those are the people that became my family and my community. And we help each other out. So the same way that like, if you go to like law school with a bunch of people and you work at a firm and then you guys all help each other get jobs or, you know, I don't know how it goes in the law world. <laughs> but it's similar with the arts, you know, I think like if you're an artist and you're trying to make it without being part of a community or having an artistic education, then it's extremely difficult to do so. Thank you, uh, Shada. And it's so heartwarming to hear this. I have this on the chat. Uh, an art teacher from Iran just texted us. She says, the role of you artists of the diaspora is very important to us and you have a great responsibility. We appreciate what you do and pray for you. Thank you, art teacher in Iran. We appreciate the work you do as well. Genus, did you want to chime in? No. Um, so uh, there, um, we don't have a lot of time left. Uh, Sefi, that there is a very important question for you in the chat box, uh, chat box from Golnaz. But I'm afraid this is one of those questions that requires two hours of discussion because somebody is asking you about the comparison uh, between the uh, Palestinian art and the resistant uh, artistic movement in South Africa, and then a comparison with Iran. If you want to answer it, like, you know, in just two, three minutes, please take it away. But if you think it's a very, very large topic, feel free to tell me. Um, so to, uh, could you please just repeat the question again? I tried to summarize the question in some way, but it Sorry. says, um, Duseppide, since successful anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, the world has been used as a key to clarify many movements. Um, I, I'm sure there's some typos here, perhaps because she was typing it fast. It was not successful in Israel-Palestine struggle. Do you feel it would be successful in Iran? Um, well, what is happening in Palestine is very upsetting. What is happening in Afghanistan is very upsetting. What is happening in Ukraine is very upsetting. But to just go back maybe to the other question, art brings hope. Art won't change the world. We might not find answers with art, but we will have the power of communities. We will have the power of conversation and holding each other together. Because if there is no hope, we cannot carry on. And I think South Africa is a very, very good example. Um, change of apartheid regime didn't happen overnight. It was a long journey to freedom. And P -p perhaps that's why I felt home here, because people really fight for their freedom here. And now they're celebrating their freedom. And it will happen. It's sad that it happened. It hasn't happened in Palestine. It hasn't happened in Iran yet. In many countries, people are suffering. But we need to keep hope. And art has the tool to create a conversation, to educate and to bring a um, lighter side of the things out. Thank you, Sepida, very thoughtful. And I, 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 I agree with you on that. 
especially in this day and age with social media, you know, we have seen uh, uh, the significance of images and how impactful images can be. And in some ways, the role that literature was probably playing back in the 19th century has now been occupied by visual arts. So that's why art is very important in terms of changing people's minds, in, in terms of bringing awareness. So uh, we only have four minutes left. I just want to read a very beautiful text written by Bahar Befahani, uh, who is um, a very, very strong artist uh, in her own right. And she has generously written something to us that I would like to share with you. She says, I just wanted to say hello to Jinusa Aziz. Thank you. Sepide Aziz, Sheida, and Pamela John. Thank you all for the very layered presentations and issues you brought up. It's absolutely refreshing to question Shamlu, Jinus, this is for you, as a key figure in Iran contemporary, in Iranian contemporary intellectual history. That itself would be a revolutionary act. Indeed, Bahar, thank you for your correct reading of the situation. I wanted to ask everyone on the panel that could you see our relationship to art at this moment through the process of the work, rather defining what would be the work of artists at this moment? Um, Take it away, anyone who wants to reflect on this. I think for me, the work of the artist at this moment is always what comes first and then the process is what follows. So I would not say that I'm a process-based artist. For me, it's um, I'm excavating and interrogating. And I think those are the initial acts. And however, the process of the work comes about, that's generally what follows. Um, in this situation, I always try to be aware and I, uh, I know we have to watch very carefully and maybe we can have um, right reflection, um, but it's not more than reflection, I think. Just it depends on how much you try to be, to care, uh, to um, try uh, to watch everything exactly and just um, have very small reflection but in you think about all of reflection um i had a series of artwork more than um 14 maybe now 14, 15 years ago, Rock, Paper, Scissor was about um, Islamic uh, Revolution, Republic, Islamic Revolution. And that was the name Rock, Paper, Scissor. But I felt that revolution are based on speed reflection. We had that experience before. So maybe we have to change something inside us this time not just reflection, rock, paper, scissor, rock, paper, scissor. It's not a game that just you should have reflect, uh, reflection about everything. And maybe we have to play chess <laughs> more than rock, paper, scissor. So uh, I think we uh, 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 always I think about this thing, about my artwork and about my reflection about the situation with my art. Excellent. Thank you so much, Genus. That's a very good note to end this panel on. And I just wanted to say that there were several other questions. I apologize to our audiences if we didn't get a chance to get to them, uh, but I am available to answer those questions. And we are all available indeed. Feel free to email us as, as far as I know. Our webinar host uh, has also collected some of those questions, uh, which we can return to later on. Uh, what a great panel. Thank you so much, Sheda, Sepide, and Jinus, uh, for, um, uh, oh, for enlightening us. Thank you so much, Jinus, so and much. for thank you, and for bringing so much new angle, so many new angles to this uh, discussion. Sepide coming from South Africa, telling us something very, very refreshing about what's going on and so many more items that were discussed here that were extremely informative. 
I really, really appreciate that. So on this note, I know we are one minute over the time of slot that was given to us. Uh, I want to thank our audiences and thank you all again and also thank uh, the Jolly News Endowed um, Lectureship for Persian Culture at Georgetown University and especially Dr. Farima Sadiq Mostofi for all of her efforts behind the scene. Thank you so much. On this note, uh, according to our webinar host, uh, we should mute our microphones and wait for the webinar host to end this panel. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to our dear panelists. On behalf of Professor Mustafi and the Persian Studies Program, I want to thank everyone who joined us today and for your questions. Um, for more information, the webinar has been recorded. Uh,